in fact, I think I frequently said, you know, there are all these other little side projects that we had started up and I'd say, yeah. well, yeah, if one of those gets to the right size or somebody comes with the right thing, maybe I would sell that, but you'll yeah. have to pry the agency out of my cold dead hands. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. This episode is brought to you by Yellow Images. Guys, I'm really excited to share with you our latest sponsor, Yellow Images. There are a ton of places on the web right now to find ready-to-use solutions, but let me tell you why I'm excited to be the first to introduce you to Yellow Images. It's the number one marketplace with more than 40,000 premium mockups, fonts, 360 images, and a ton of other graphic assets to really make your job easier. Not to mention all those textures, patterns, presets, and UX UI kits. But there are really two things that I'm most excited about. Number one are their mockups. You know how some clients are like, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, Yellow Images has mockups that are high resolution with great lighting and shadows that will really help you sell your latest design or brand pitch by helping your clients see what it's going to look like. And number two is Yellow isn't just here to provide you with amazing assets, they wanna help you out too. So if you're seeking to create some passive income, become an author, put your work up for sale at Yellow Images and start getting paid for your own mockups, 360 images and fonts. Lastly, like any good podcast sponsor, Yellow Images has come through with a great offer. If you sign up today, they have a limited number of discounts just for our listeners. Head over to yellowimages.com and be sure to enter promo code obsessed at checkout. That's yellowimages.com and use promo code obsessed at checkout. Show them some love. I think you're going to dig what they're up to. Now back to the show. Let's talk about today's episode. Okay, guys, today on Obsessed Show, we've got a little bit of a part two. So last week we had Mike Janda, who's one of the co-hosts of the Biz Buds podcast. But the more that we dug in there, even though I've talked to Tom Ross a couple of times, that was my first time interacting with Mike. And uh, we chatted a little bit after the show and decided, and we need to do a, a part two just with him. We have so many like weird parallels of our, our paths. So without further ado, please enjoy this sort of part two. <laughs> with Mike Janda. Mike, welcome back hey. to Obsessed Show. Thank you. So excited to be back on the show. It was a fun conversation last week, but like you said, when we started bouncing around in, in DMs afterwards, hey, I sold my agency too, and I sold mine. And we thought, hey, it'd be fun to, to chat through that process. People are interested in that. I've had people say, yeah. why, why did you even sell? Why would you ever sell your agency? And I've never really shared the the full mindset. And it's gonna be fun to collaborate on this with you because you have a similar exact story. Yeah. And maybe we don't have to go all the way back to zero or or maybe it's helpful, but um like how did your agency come to be? Is that something you always thought you wanted to do? Or was it like you and some people who got together, or was it just yourself like freelancing that turned into an agency? But that, like there's so many ways that those can take shape. Yeah. I'm just curious kind of what the impetus was for you. Mine was um I'm an accidental entrepreneur. I was working at Fox Studios in LA in 2000, from 2000 to 2002. And the, we had September 11th, we had the dot bomb tech <laughs> bubble right. burst. People started downsizing. We had economic worries and concerns and all kinds of crazy things happening economically. And it, during that time, Fox sold our divisions to Disney and Disney started dismantling the team. Our team of 50 people went down to six of us on the very last day. Hmm. Now, as the team was whittling down over the course of a year and a half, I had friends who I would go to lunch with and hang out with, and they were in the office next to me, and they started landing at other Hollywood companies, Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony, my first three clients. And my hmm. friends would get over there, and they were marketing directors, marketing managers, and they didn't have internal teams anymore because the the time was let's downsize internal teams, not hire internal teams. So they were a marketing manager that still had to produce design work and they started sending freelance work to me because of relationship and, and trust. And that's what started to grow my agency. So when I finally got laid off from Fox, 
I start, I was freelancing already. I had been freelancing for six months, double dipping. I would go to work all day and then I would build just as much money each month freelancing as I was making at mm -hmm. Fox. And I saved every penny of it. So when I finally got let go at Fox, I had my little bit of seed money, my nest egg to mm -hmm. make it so I didn't freak out and uh, started freelancing and just building that. And it organically grew over time, but it was never me saying, I'm going to conquer this mountain and build this agency. Yeah. In fact, I resisted it for the first two or three years where I was, I got to work in 80, 100 hour weeks, just grinding myself down to nothing because I was afraid to hire people. I was afraid to grow. I didn't have business partners. I didn't have a mentor. I was just in there getting tons of work because I was doing good enough work to satisfy my clients and I was a nice person to work with. And, and it just grew out of that. Once I let go, not to keep going on this, but once I let go of the reins on this horse that wanted to run and I, I started hiring people Year number one that I hired people, I went from one employee to five employees. The year after that, I went from five to 10 employees. And once I just kind of let go and let the horse run, things started to grow like crazy. Yeah, that, so many parallels there. Sounds so familiar. Um, so mine, the main difference was I, I always thought that I wanted to own my own agency, but I never had really like thought through what that means. Yeah. Like, is that just me or is it a team of 10 people or a hundred people? Yeah. And I think not kind of getting concrete on that vision was one of my biggest mistakes early on was I was, you know, in, in the best possible way I was trying to grow opportunistically. So I, as I'd look at an opportunity, I would decide, what am I going to do with this? Like, yeah. do I take this? Yes or no. As opposed to, does this fit my vision of what I want this thing to be? So it wasn't so much resistant, but also it wasn't so much with clarity either, yeah. <laughs> but it's it was the same thing of like working for somebody else for a couple months and saving up and got yeah. to the point of like, okay, I want to have enough to be able to pay myself out of the business without bankrupting my savings. Yeah. Um, and you know, kind of started off slowly and conservatively similarly, yeah. I guess, to what you're saying. So it's interesting that you talk about vision because I, I just launched this big freelancer course. And when I started doing the very first module of that course, it was the sales module. And I started thinking, okay, sales, how do I teach people how to sell creative services for their business? And I went all the way back to what even is the business that you're even trying to build? And I take mm -hmm. the first five or six lessons are all about how do I build a vision of what I want this to become? Because I can't sell my services to anybody if I don't even know what, what the freak I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. What am I trying and, to build here? <laughs> exactly. And I did the same thing. It was like, I didn't have a vision at the start. I was just like, I called myself the graphic design whore and <laughs> not to be crude, but it was just like, okay, it, whatever you want, you know, pay me enough money. I'll do whatever you need. And our joke was when the phone rings, we say, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. That's what I did until I started figuring out, Oh, wait a second. I don't need to be needy. I don't need to be afraid. I need mm -hmm. to be vision and purpose driven to build this as a real business. And once I started to tweak the dials in my brain to perceive my role in the business as that I've got to create a vision and then I've got to sell my employees on embracing that vision. And then I've got to help my clients understand that vision of the business. Then things start to explode out of that. And a so lot how of far entrepreneurs. were you into your business before you feel like you started to kind of get into that groove? It was, it was when I had, you know, when I had these first, so, so my first five employees, I would say were just production appendages. And, and I love these people. No, I'm not trying to, to, to downplay them. But for me, it was like, I needed more hands yeah. to push pixels around. Yeah. Extensions of you really. Yeah, exactly. That's what it was. And when I got to about five employees, it's when I started to sit back and realize, you know what, this is actually going to be something. This is mm -hmm. a business. This is, this is a real thing. I've got to I got to take this seriously. And I started reading books. I started reading things like good to great at the time was a really popular book. The E-Myth, um, which is one of the, the books that transformed oh, yeah, my absolutely. mindset. Yeah. It changed everything for me. And I started to realize 
and in that book, you know, it talks about the technician, the manager, and the entrepreneur, these three different roles. And I realized all I was doing was like technician and some manager work. And I had to do some entrepreneur work and Mm -hmm. entrepreneur work is two things. There's two things for an entrepreneur. You have to create a vision for the future of your company and roll that vision out. And then number two is you have to create profitability for the shareholders of the business. Once I understood that, I was like, okay, I'm the sole shareholder of this business. So I've got to make it profitable for me. Mm -hmm. And I've got to create a vision of where this business is going to even go. Which one of those two do you think is harder for most designers starting out launching a business? Is it is profit a harder thing or is vision a harder thing? Oh, I think it's vision. I think that people are afraid to think big. And, and I think by nature, and, and I'm sure you'd agree, by nature, designers, creative people, we just ha- are naturally insecure people. Mm-hmm. And the idea of sitting down and saying, I'm going to build the 100 person agency, like you just mentioned, I'm going to build that. Is so it's scary. We're insecure. Can we really do it? Uh, I don't know. And so we're afraid to make a vision like that because what if it doesn't happen? You know, there, we talk ourselves out of it. So I think vision's really tough for creatives to to expand their mindset to to realize what they can really accomplish in their careers. I had this as a problem when I decided to be a designer and study design at Indiana University. You know, we have that, that Indiana tie in common. I, I remember thinking, you know what, I'd rather be a starving artist. I think someday, I, I literally thought these numbers, I thought someday I'll max out and I'll be making 60 grand a year as a creative director somewhere. And you know what, I'd rather do that and be happy doing design in my life than making millions of dollars hating my life as being a business person or something. Mm-hmm. I, it was such a narrow vision because two years well, later, I was making between that, right? It's either 60 yeah, it was or either. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. And, uh, there, and two years after that, I was making 60 grand a year and I was a creative director and I'm like, Whoa, I already accomplished my dream from college and it's only been two years. And that started to help me realize, you know what? There's really no limit to the amount of income you can make as a designer, as a creative. There's no limit to the success you can have. You just got to expand your vision and decide to go for it. You know, a friend of mine told me um, a few years ago, as I was turning 40, he was like, this this whole 40-year-old midlife crisis idea yeah. is is a lot of it is based on getting to the point of you've accomplished everything you ever sought out. Mm-hmm. and not knowing what's next. And I think some of us hit that when we're 25 or when we're 32 or when we're 40 or when we're 57, but like having that vision that kind of has a lid on it, you know, there's, yeah. there's no end to it. There's no, no bigger thing outside of yourself. I think that's where we can get kind of tripped up. Oh, I love that. And, and I, I felt that around 40. Um, I sold my agency when I was 43 So Mm -hmm. interestingly, and when I was 40, it was the biggest year ever in my agency. I had 20 employees. I owned my new studio space that I designed it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it was wood floor, exposed beams and glass walls and all the stuff that I had always ever dreamed of having. We had done huge projects. We were in the middle of a $500,000 project for Kraft Foods And I was like, you know what? I've checked every single box and then some of what I ever hoped this to ever be. And I wouldn't say I had a midlife crisis at that time. I had a few leading up to that in my 30s. I think I had a couple (laughs) third life crises is during that time. Um, But there was something in that. That's interesting that you say that because I had I had checked off so many of the boxes that were beyond even what I ever dreamed of. And I had to create a new vision for the rest of my career. What is, what comes next after this? And a lot of it is what I'm doing now. And I'm sure you're in the same situation. You got a great podcast. You're, you're doing something new. It's a new chapter in your life. Yeah. And one of the things that um, you talked about on our last episode with Tom was that you're in this new phase of, of your professional career where you want to give back and where you want to kind of create things for other people and help them out. Um, and, and I'm sure maybe this is part of it. Like looking back on, on my journey as a business owner, as a, somebody who started a creative agency, um, 
I'd think, man, if I had it to do over, here's a couple of big mistakes that I would avoid, or here's a yeah. couple of big decisions that I would do differently. Um, especially as you're coaching, I'm sure this comes up frequently, but what are some of those key things that you look back at and either think I lucked into getting this thing right. And it's a thing that I coach people on, or what mm -hmm. are some of those things that you feel like people are most likely those potholes they're most likely to hit along the way? Um, that's a great question. So I fortunately did a lot of things right. And I think anybody who's a successful entrepreneur, the, the way to be a successful entrepreneur is you do 51% of the things right and 49% <laughs> of the things wrong. Right. That's, the, that's the way that's the successful entrepreneur that's and the 51, <laughs> yeah, the 51 percent is the difference maker. And now all of a sudden you're billing millions of dollars and you got a lot of profit. If you do it, just the flip 51% wrong and 49% you're the failed one year business, just like so many mm -hmm. businesses that start. So, um, so I, I fortunately did just enough things, right? One of the things that I, that Okay. Well, we talked about vision. That was one of the problems mm -hmm. at the start of the, the years, um, not having a vision. That was the wrong thing. And I do work with people in coaching of working on the vision. I, sure. this is what you've got to solve first. What do you even want? Because you can be successful in any, any channel you choose. You can be a successful solo freelancer. Look at, um, Aaron Draplin, for example, totally, one of yeah. the big name, solo brand freelancers. Now I doubt that he works completely alone. He's probably got some people, but it is his brand. He's known as a solo independent person, massively successful, um, massively influential, and one of the greatest personal brands in all of the design world. So there's a success as an independent. You can be a boutique agency. You can decide, you know what? I want to just be a 10 person shop and I want to grind on this one niche and be known for this thing. That's mm -hmm. what I want to be. And you embrace the idea that I'm going to be a boutique agency. And there are a lot of great, amazing boutique agencies out there. And there's a lot of money to be made as a boutique agency. That was a really great phase in my business was, you know, the 10 to 12 people thing a lot of profit and a lot of a lot less stress than going to the next tier which is the 20 30 40 50 person agency the dynamics change of the business and you can be a super successful full blown agency with a full suite of services from strategy services to ongoing marketing fulfillment you can run the gamut the agency that i sold to we had 80 employees and we had multiple departments and you know, we had a full strategy team. We had this huge development team and we were doing these full blown engagements for clients ongoing over years of time. And you can be super successful in that model. So I think getting back to the question, what do a lot of people not do right? It's not deciding which of those channels they want because you can be massively successful in any one. They all have pros and cons. The other big mistake I think that people make is not understanding their numbers, not running their business like a real business and tracking their data, projecting their revenue, understanding their cash flow, tracking just as things as simple as your, your win loss ratio of your proposals, mm -hmm. you know, just tracking that knowing I'm winning X percentage of proposals at X average value. And all of a sudden you can project forward your, your numbers uh, based on that. And you can understand and create a sales flow in the data of your business. I think that's where a lot of creative struggle is just not understanding the data. Now, because you keep asking me questions and I want to know <laughs> more things about you. Right. Um, what, what do you think are the, the couple things that, the big mistakes that people make and what were the ones that you made at the mm. start of yours? Well, one, and I totally agree with that. As long as your as your good, good things outweigh the mistakes, then I think you're in good shape because yeah. I would look back every six months or every 18 months early on and go, how did we make it through that? Like we yeah. screwed up really big with that one <laughs> thing or how were we missing that piece? Um, one of those big pieces that we were missing was a written contract. Mm. So like, two or three years in, we finally got around to like, Hey, we've got like five or six people that just aren't paying their bills. What's going on. 
Yeah. And then we started trying to figure out how to get paid on these projects and then realizing, Oh, maybe we, maybe we need more than just a handshake. Like maybe we're getting to the point that we don't personally know every client anymore. Right. It's, it's not just somebody who's good for it necessarily. So, you know, just getting a little bit more strict about, um, scope and timeline and budget and what payment terms look like. And, you know, yeah. that's, that's probably the best money you can spend with an attorney, uh, early on in your business is, is making sure that you've got a good agreement. Um, was that something that you figured out quickly? Oh yeah. Yeah, man, that w- that's a good one. And, and I didn't figure it out quickly. I started with just these little one pager things with like line item prices on it mm-hmm. here. Just, and, and I just kept building that over time. I never had a downloadable version. I never adapted somebody else's contract. I just like every single time I got screwed on a project, mm-hmm. I would be like, why did I get screwed on this new clause? You know, that's <laughs> I'd write up the new clause and, <laughs> and stick it into my contract. And, um, and that, that is a big deal. And that is something that a lot of creatives wait too long to do. Even if you're a freelancer, just independent mm-hmm. freelancer, cranking part-time out of your basement in the after hours of your full-time job, you still need to have a documented formal agreement with your client. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be a 50 page thing, but it's got to be written and it's got to be clear. The client has to know exactly what they're going to get and what they are going to pay. And you have to know exactly what you're going to do and how much you're going to charge the client. And that's the, the fundamental root of, of the contract. So at least write up some formal document that defines those two things. Yeah. And I, I think the two bonus features that we, um, added pretty quickly in the, in the contract that are helpful. Um, one is that the, the intellectual property doesn't transfer until it's paid in full. Yeah. So they can't use the thing that they paid half for. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is a little word called indemnification, which means if yeah. they give you something, they can't come back to sue you later to say, that's something you couldn't, that, um, you used that got us in trouble while well, you gave it to us. So, and it yeah. works both ways. So you, it, you, a perfect contract, or I think a fair contract is one that says has mutual indemnification. So if, if yeah. you've got a designer who finds something on the web and borrows it and you don't know about it and your firm sells it to somebody and they get sued, yeah. like you're in trouble too. So, yeah. um, so I think that's a totally uh, fair and a, and a great safety to have in place. Yeah. Both of those things. I have both of them in my, in my contracts and, and they're both super, super important. Yep. Okay. Well, before you ask me another question and you get off the hook of telling me more about, so you started 2003, you started your agency, right? But you went with the mindset that I want, I've always wanted to do this. I've always yeah, wanted to right. start. And then tell me, tell me your synopsis of growth and and how it all happened for you. Yeah. So, I mean, again, we've got so many parallels, like on paper, I started the agency in 02 and I started working in it full time in 03. So it was uh-huh. kind of this side project thing that I was running freelance through in the evenings. And, um, I had gone to Purdue university and done a lot of work when I was in house with their printing services division with the athletics department. So they were they'd been sending me projects since I graduated basically. So like the softball team needs a new poster or the, the -hmm. football team's going to a bowl game and they need a cover for their, their program guide or, you know, so I was doing a lot of athletics stuff like that. Yeah. Um, And then little projects here and there. And, uh, you know, just got to the point of momentum where I was like seeing enough work that I realized, okay, I have a little bit saved and there's enough going on here. Like, and the economy's not great. So if, if I could maybe make a go of it now, like, why not? Yeah. So, yeah. um, pulled the trigger with this experiment of, okay, I, I don't want to dip into savings the first month and by month two or three, I forget what it was now. Um, I want the business to pay me out of income that yeah. the business is making. And Good. that experiment went on for 16 years after yeah. that. So <laughs> that worked out yeah. pretty well until yeah. I left. Okay. Okay. So tell me your growth. Yeah. That's a lot of parallels in, in mine and same mindset on, mm-hmm the money side of things too. Um, so your growth, so you started it just you. Yeah. I was totally solo in my proverbial basement. Uh Um, And by the end of the first year, I brought on my first hire. So I brought him on contract, then we got more time together and then brought him on full time after that. 
Okay. And then you grew over 16 years of time and you sold your agency or left your agency or what, what, what yeah, was so it? That? I brought in a business partner about two years before I left. Okay. And never with the intent of leaving. I, yeah. In fact, I think I frequently said, you know, there are all these other little side projects that we had started up and I'd say, yeah. well, yeah, if one of those gets to the right size or somebody comes with the right thing, maybe I would sell that, but you'll yeah. have to pry the agency out of my cold dead hands. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and enough personal things changed that I was like, you know what? I just need a break. I need something different. I need to, yeah. I need to, I need to step away. Yeah. And I knew that my, most importantly, my heart wasn't in the business anymore. Yeah. Um, Ironically, I got, um, we had our best year ever as I was leaving. Oh, that's Similarly, great. Like yeah. when I, when I was no longer emotionally vested in all these decisions or hand wringing over things or stressing, and I was just yeah. acting in the way that I knew I should from a business standpoint, Yeah, it was like clockwork, man. It just yeah. like, so that's, that's another one of those things that like, man, if I had to do it over, just being like sort of emotionally disconnecting from some of those decisions really made them made it easier to make the right call. Yeah. Um, and just to look at it more objectively, almost like you would a client project because yeah. you don't look at a, or at least I didn't look at client projects and go, Oh man, I don't know if that's the right decision. I would just look at it and go, here's the data. Yeah, <laughs> here's the right exactly. Decision. Here's yep, the right look it. for you because of what you told me you wanted. This is, I can confidently tell you this is the right answer. Yeah. Um, and then in that last year, I was able to do that for us. Um, so that was, that was really interesting, but yeah. So that's sold awesome out to him, um, after about two years together. And then, uh, he took the agency on for about another two years and he just rolled in with another group here recently. Oh, he did. Okay, good. All right. Well, that, yeah, so many parallels on that. One of the things that you mentioned was, um, you were ready for something new. It was just time. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I talk about this sometimes and, and this will resonate with you. I'm like, you can't last more than like 15 years in agency life before it kills you. Just it's, it kills your soul for some, it's the grind of it. The, the client chasing and the change order navigation, and mm, then right. the employee grind and replacing your creative director again it's such a, a brutal grind that as a sole owner of an agency, I don't know that, I don't know how anybody lasts longer than that. Um, that's where I got, that's where I got in those yeah. last few years. And I think that one of the things at the, at the early years of my business, you know, these first 10 years of growing, it was so exhilarating it was exhilarating to land the next big client. It was exhilarating to land the next big project. It was like so exciting. It was like, and then to start winning awards, you know, when we win FWA or we win an Addy, get on the Addy yes side of the day and stuff and, or not the Addy, but the uh, all awards side of the day. And you win best in show at the Addies and things. We had these things happen. And all of a sudden it's just like, check in a box, check in a box, check in a box. Oh, now we build a million a year, check the box. Now we build 2 million a year, check the box. And now I've got 20 employees, check the box. And, and once you don't have any more boxes to check, all of a sudden you're like, why am I still doing this? This is right. so stressful and so emotionally draining on me. Why am I doing this when I've checked all the boxes I ever dreamed of checking in my life? Yeah. It's back and, to that midlife crisis thing. It's yeah. the, you've accomplished all the things that you want, but all the, all the pain is still coming along with it without, without any big goals left. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's what happened to me. So 2015, when I sold, that's where I was. I was like, you know what, I'm either going to wind this thing down to just a core small team that does one type of service mm -hmm. or I'm going to go, I'm going to sell it and, and move on to something else. And I reached out to a agency that I know in my area that three years before this came to me and said, Hey, we, we were thinking maybe, what would it look like if we merged our agencies? So they came to me and I, at the time I was like in the biggest 
heyday ever in my business. I, we had just moved into our brand new studio space. I bought the space. It was like the dream was finally coming true, all of it. And at the time, so I was like, no, you know what? It's not a good fit for me right now. But three years after that, I was, I was like, okay, I checked all the boxes I want. Now I'm, I'm not feeling this anymore. I don't want to be the solo agency owner grinding this out anymore. And so I reached out to them and said, Hey, I'm at a crossroads in my, in my agency. I'm going to either sell it or I'm going to wind it down. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I may wind it down completely and then go off and start writing more books and stuff. I had my first book was already out. And so I might go, I was just ready for something new. And they were having the biggest year in the history of their agency. And they said, well, don't wind it down. Don't do that. Let's keep talking. And so, (laughs) and so, uh, yeah. And so they did and they, they made a purchase offer and I accepted and, um, and it became a new start for me and it got me excited because now part my my acquisition was some money at close so there was a little bit of money there there was some money over time over i think it was spread over a year and a half 18 months or something that they they did the rest of the financial payout and then there was minority ownership in the combined agency so i had a mm, percentage cool. ownership yeah and so I was motivated again. I was excited to do the, do the next thing. And I had three partners. One of the partners was the CEO. He was a majority owner. The other partner was the CTO. He was a majority owner. And then there was the marketing, the, the CMO. He was a minority owner. And there was me as the chief creative officer as the, minority, the other minority owner. And so the four of us were partners and I became reinvigorated in my career. I was like, okay, I got a team of 80 people. I haven't been on this mountain before. I'm going to go, what can, what, what can I do on this mountain? And I became super driven and ambitious on that. And that lasted about two and a half years before I started to feel like, okay, have we accomplished everything that we want? We made Inc. 5,000 two years in a row. And we started winning awards at that agency and started getting some of the big clients that I had at my agency, we were able to port them over to this agency. And, and then I got to the point again where it was like, okay, is this, is this scratching the itch anymore? And it's interesting. Just the thought I had as you're describing that is um, I think as a solo agency owner, it's hard to tell the difference between how it feels at a plateau where you've done everything that you think you can do and you just can't get any further on your own or like, am I in a trough? Am I in a ditch? Am I, cause it, cause it feels so alone when you're yeah. by yourself and you've been doing that for year after year after year. Um, yeah. and I, and I think it's tough to tough to tell the difference some days of like, am I just as high as I'll ever get on my own or is it, you know, am I, am I just in a rut? Yeah. And I had employees who I, who I tried to, I get, they had profit sharing. They had, um, I even had a buy sell agreement. If I died, they, these, my two, my right and left two people inherited the company Mm, and there was a life insurance policy that would pay out my wife. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had it structured like that. So I was, I had two people that I tried to buy complete loyalty from through ownership stake and, um, empowering them to own certain, like to, to be responsible for certain aspects of the business. And I was trying to fully replicate myself to where I could just own this agency and not have to be in the grind of every day. But at the end of the day, I learned that you can't fully transition ownership emotionally from one person to the next. As much as you try, it is the, is the hardest thing to get somebody to buy your vision mm-hmm. to where they turn it into their vision. It's tough. Yeah. And, and to get that to translate in full, I think is, is probably not reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And it was unreasonable. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, fault to me that I thought that that was a possibility, but it wasn't a reasonable expectation. And I probably should have changed behavior and mindset 
to realize that sooner, but nobody, I didn't ever have the coach or mentor that ever told me it's unreasonable. So you, Josh, Josh and I are telling you listeners right now, it's unreasonable for you to ever (laughs) think that somebody is going to feel like the way you do about your business. Your employees will not feel that same way about your business. There's always going to be a measure of I'm the employee, not the sole owner of this creative venture. Yeah. And I, and I think there's probably people right now who are employees who are listening to this and like maybe a little bit offended (laughs) by that idea. Maybe. And it's, and it's not, I don't think that's a knock. That's just a, there's no possible way that you would understand like the seat that the owner is in when you are the employee and kind of operating in that space. And, you know, I had plenty of employees who left to start their own thing, which is really cool. Like that's Mm -hmm. one of the things that when I look back on the legacy of the company I started, I am most proud of the other companies that started from that because, Mm -hmm. you know, it birthed something. And I'm not saying it's all me, not by any stretch, but like just the idea that multiple people who worked for me got inspired enough while they were there to go do their own thing. Yeah. That, that's super cool. And I'm sure that they would, if I could get them on this show right now, most of them would probably say the same thing. Like I didn't know, I didn't know what I was in for. I didn't know the yeah. stress. I didn't know all the good things, all the bad things. Like there's just no way you could know the difference. I, I love, I had the same thing and, and I love seeing that as well. And I especially love the messages that have come to me from those people four or five years later and they email me out of the blue and they say, I've had like two or three of these and they say, I had no idea what it was like. Sorry that I was a a challenging employee. (laughs) And, um, and I'm so grateful for the things I learned while I was at your agency, seeing you trying to navigate it because I'm in some of those same, those same challenges right now. And now I get it. I've had two, I know of two exact messages that are almost identical to what I just said to you. And and when I hear that, I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you for finally understanding um, <laughs> what it's like. And, you know, I, and I don't want my comment from before to, to feel like a knock on anybody because I always gave my heart. I'm glad you said that. I always gave yeah. my heart to my employer. I gave my heart. I wanted it. When I worked at Fox, I wanted it to be the next 20 years of my career. I wanted that. That's what I wanted. Um, I had my job before Fox. I wanted that to be the next 20 years of my career. I did give my heart, but at the end of the day, that company went belly up and lost all their venture capital. And it was, it just became a mess. That was my, my company before Fox that I worked at. Um, at the end of the day, I wasn't the CEO of that company watching the dollars just fall between my fingers and just the whole company implode. Uh, I never felt that that way, that the way that that person did, because I was an employee of the business. And so I wanted to give my heart. I did give my heart. But at the end of the day, there was no possible way for me to really understand what that CEO was going through. Yeah, totally. So the the first place that I worked um, out of school was a medium sized ad agency in Indianapolis. Um, and they ended up closing down about a year, a year and a half after I left and, you know, kind of, it was one of those situations where the, the writing was kind of on the wall, you know, it was after September 11th, we lost a couple of key clients. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and the, the owners were both losing family members just to old age and, Mm -hmm. you know, just lots of awful life situations happening all, all at the same time. And so I think people were starting to step away. So, um, you know, I left before they had to close the doors, but I can just imagine that, that feeling of being in the agency as they close or being at the company when it goes out of business is totally different on the employee side than it is on the owner side. You're just, you know, you take your box of things and and it's a bad day and you go find your next opportunity, but the, the owners have a whole nother set of things that they're dealing with in that situation. Yeah, they're they're left standing the bag of or holding the bag of poo at the end of the day. And everybody else, (laughs) everybody else can leave and go start their next job and and be working again somewhere else with a new start in a week. But the owner is holding the bag of poo, trying to unwind it. How do I dispose of this poo that I have left that I'm standing here holding? Um, and there there are two ways out. Uh in if you own an agency, you're either going to stay in it until the day you die. You can sell it 
to somebody else and they can take the bag of poo. It's it's such a negative connotation, but (laughs) if you own an agency, you know what I'm talking about. Um, And you can, you can, you can mean the bag of poo lovingly. (laughs) Exactly. Now the bag of poo, you can make a lot of money holding the bag of poo. If you're holding the bag of poo, it is a very, it's a very financially lucrative position to be in. Um, But it also starts to smell over time. So anyway, uh, it's such a, such a, such a negative uh, perspective, but, (laughs) but the truth is, is that you can sell it to somebody else or sell it to one of your partners like you did to where you can say, okay, I'm not going to hold that anymore. I'm I'm, going to do something else. Um, But that's really it. Or you can wind it down. Now, winding it down and turning it off is so expensive. I would look at that as a scenario when I decided, okay, I think I'm ready for something new. And the cost to wind it down is so expensive because you have to keep the employees... You have to turn off the faucet of income, but you have to fulfill all the contracts you have in place. So you have to be staffed and you're just spending the money to fulfill the agreements, but you turn off the income stream. And I'm so glad that I didn't have to go that route because that one would be really, really challenging. Yeah, definitely. I want to go back a second to, you said a minute ago, and I don't even remember which point it was, but you said, I didn't have a coach telling me Mm -hmm. X. Um, did you ever bring on coaches or business advisors along the way on the business or, you know, are you just magically transformed into one without having? (laughs) Yes. Matt is magically transformed. I never had a coach. I got my, it was pre podcast. The growth years were pre podcast. You know, this, you were doing the same thing. No podcasts, no YouTube channels, right? No, even online courses that said, Hey, here's how to build an agency. There was nothing out there. So I read was still making visual effects. He wasn't coaching anybody. (laughs) Yep. I, I read books. That was it. And, and every book I read, I were, were business books. They weren't even niched to creative businesses. We, I mentioned good, great. And the e-myth too, that had a big impact on me. Uh, but I had to take the concepts out of a traditional business book And then kind of figure out how do I apply these concepts in my creative business? Because there wasn't any kind of niche training. Um, I'd never even looked for a coach or a a mentor of any kind. I never sought it out. I just, trial and error was my teacher. And I suppose I could have grown faster and probably made more money had I had somebody tell me the things I didn't know in advance of me having to learn them by experience, but I'm not, but I'm grateful that I did learn them the way that I did. I'm glad that I learned from experience because every time I get on a coaching session or a podcast, we can talk about anything because I've got in my 15 years of agency grind, 16 years of agency grind, I've got, I got a story for everything. I I learned it all from, from getting punched in the face over that amount of time. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Are there, um, so I often ask our guests about design heroes, but I'm, I'm curious kind of on the other side of things, if there are other coaches or advisors in the creative space that you're a big fan of or anybody that, that you look up to as well currently. Um, you know what? I, I don't, well, so Tom Ross, who we were on with last week, um, and, and I'm going to shout him out about this. Uh, it's rare that I have somebody push me because I'm really ambitious and driven, self-motivated and driven and ambitious. And over the past month, Tom has pushed me in a way that I haven't been pushed in a long time. He's scheduled a ton of podcast Mm -hmm. collaborations. Like every other day, I'm on another collab podcast with Tom and we're doing our podcast. And then he, he pushed me and said, Mike, we gotta, we gotta increase our listeners. And Let's just do, instead of recording a podcast today, let's do an hour long brainstorm on how we're going to market our podcast. And I was like, all right, man. And so we made up this whole huge (laughs) list. And then he's like messaging me saying, okay, I'm making this. Are you okay to post this uh, next week? And, And it's just pushing me and driving me. And so I really look up to him 
right now as the person who is pushing and motivating me more than almost anybody has in a long, long time in my career. Um, now, outside of that, to be honest, I mute a lot of other people similar to me because I don't want to be influenced by them because I have enough proprietary stuff to share of my own that I don't want to see what they're posting. I don't yeah. want to see what they're sharing. I don't want to see their approach because I don't want it to change the content strategies that I share myself. So it's not that I don't love those people and appreciate what they're giving. I just completely am, am committed to letting my own experience be the thing that drives me in the type of content I share and the type of things that I do. And I haven't run out of stuff yet on that. So I kind of don't want to see what other people are doing because I don't want to be influenced by it. Yeah. I think that take, makes total sense. Um, maybe back to a theme that keeps running through this conversation about like those next goals or what other big things you've got out there, um, outside of more of what you're doing. Um, do you have any other big goals, you know, another book or, um, short I, film? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I, know what's on I, the have, list. I have a handful of courses that I have planned. So I just launched my big suite of freelance courses. Um, I have a handful of courses that, that I want to do still. I love the courses um, because I know so many people need it. And I'm in this mindset of, I want to fix these problems for people that they don't even know they have, or they know they have, and they don't know where to get the answer. So I love the course flow that I can just build a concept on top of another concept over time. And um, so I, I'm really motivated by that right now. I have like three or four other books that I have rough outlined because over the years of time, I've, I mean, my first book was in 2013. As soon as it was published, I've started thinking of other books. They just start popping in my head because now this is a real <laughs> option. I'm oh. laughing because we're the same person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. So that's what I, that's what I have. I'm like, okay, I got other books that are popping in my head because now it's, it's an option. I broke the four minute mile. I had a book. Now I can make other books. Now yeah, where can now it go? That you, know you know, it's possible. Yeah. Now that you know, it's possible. Uh, so, so I have other things like that, but I want to travel all over the world and do workshops and speaking and things. I was supposed to go to Ghana this year. I was supposed to go to Australia this year. Um, I was supposed to go to Dubai and speak and all these things are just to go away because of coronavirus. So I'm a little, hurt by that. I had things last year. I went to Denmark. I went to Sweden. I uh, went to Russia. I've been to Russia a few times and, and then a few places in the U S where I bounced around. And I love doing that. I love connecting with new people and, and meeting designers. And uh, so I, I, I want to do a lot of that in my future when, when the world opens up again. But to be honest right now, I, for the first time, I don't have a concrete mountain that I'm climbing. I'm just enjoying walking the path right now. And I just, I love connecting with people. I love meeting people like you and being on shows like this. And I love the, the connections I make in my social media interactions. And I'm just, I'm just loving, loving life right now. So maybe if we've got a listener who's like, I don't know if I'm ready for a coach yet. Um, but maybe you have a particular challenge you could put forth to that listener who's trying to figure out what's next. Like, is this, is this freelance thing enough that I want to make it into a business or do I want to stay solo or do I want to, you know, to kind of pick a swim lane and go like where, how, what would you, um, what challenge would you have or what, um, charge would you have to that listener? It would be create a vision board of what you want in your life, not just in your business, but in your life. And, and then, create a business that achieves that. And I say this because building an agency isn't for everybody. It, it's, it's a challenge. And I'm so glad that I did it. And I'm so glad that I carried the bag of poo around for so long. And I made a lot of money carrying the bag of poo. I'm so <laughs> glad that I did that. But it's not for everybody. Some people just don't want it. And that's okay. You have to know yourself and it's okay to embrace who you are and what you want out of life. Now, some people want to travel the world and take their kids that some people might have a goal of, 
I want to visit 100 beaches in the world. I'm a beach nut and I want to go to this beach and this beach and this beach. And if that's your goal in life, if that's the dream you have, then let's create a business that can fulfill that dream. And there are a few different ways to do that. Solo freelancer that, that works from whatever beach you're, you're traveling to next. That's one way to do it. Affiliate income, building content and building income through affiliate marketing. Another way you could do, you could fulfill that dream. There are a lot of different ways you could fill that dream. If that's the dream, some people might have the dream that they just want to go fishing every day. They love to fish so much that they just want to go fishing. Then let's fulfill that dream. But you got to have a dream of what you're wanting to, to do. And the, the sad part is to me, I think that there's so many people out there in the world that never take the time to just formulate a vision of what they want for their life. And as a result, they get up and they go to their nine to five every day. And then they go home at the end of the day and they, you know, hang out with their family. And then they go to the next day to their nine to five. And all of a sudden, 20 years have passed and they have, have nothing in life satisfaction to show for it. And then they have the midlife crisis. That's the real midlife crisis of, not the one that you've accomplished all the things that you ever dreamed of accomplishing by 40. But the other midlife crisis is I've accomplished nothing and I'm 40. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. that's the more common midlife crisis I think that people have and they realize what have I been doing? And I, I hate that for those people. So my advice after this long winded preamble is figure out what you want and it's okay to want whatever it is that you want. It can be fishing every day. If that's what you want, then let's build a business that is going to allow you to go fish every day in your life, if that's what you want. If it's building a 100-person agency, then let's do that. But figure out something, and your life is going to be more fulfilled and more happy if you figure out something that you want to try and have your life stand for 20 years from now, 30 years from now. That's great. That's definitely going to be the sound bite for this episode, by the way, is the right. <laughs> go figure out what you want and then build a business that supports that. I think that's awesome. Um, yeah. So I know we asked you just last week, even though these episodes are two weeks apart, we just chatted a week ago, uh, what you're most obsessed with right now. And so I'm going to um, switch this up just a little bit and say, like in life outside of business pursuits, uh, what do you find you are most obsessed with maybe even this week or during coronavirus? Um, what am I most obsessed with? Man, my, so much of my life just revolves around my, my work grind. I can say we sold our house yesterday. Oh, we've lived in this. Thanks. We've lived in the same house for 18 years and we're buying a new home. Um, it's only a few miles away, but it's in a new neighborhood and it's, um, we're excited for a change and uh, the reset button that we haven't had in so long. It's a new, new home, new neighbors, new life, new little thing, but we get to still retain some of the routines we have, the restaurants we go to and things, cause it's not far away from where we are. Um, so I'll, recently I've been obsessed with, with that, uh, just the getting our home ready and, and, trying to sell it and all the stuff from that. The other thing I'm obsessed with is I'm back. The gym is open and I've always been a gym rat and I am back obsessed with exercise and, and that push. Mm, uh, yeah. that's, that's what kept me sane during the agency life. I, I worked out probably five times a week before work for the entire run of my agency. And then after work, I went, I got a black belt in karate during while I was building my agency because after work, I would go to my karate school and spar and have classes and things. And so it was just exercise kept me uh, sane and kept the stress level manageable. Uh, so I'm, I'm back being kind of obsessed with that, but I'm also still obsessed with eating cheeseburgers because that's what I started doing <laughs> in coronavirus. And and I haven't, you know. uh, I haven't scaled back my <laughs> diet yet. <laughs> nice. I wish, um, I wish I would have had that kind of relationship with the gym when I was an agency owner. I, I had the kind of relationship where well, it was mostly the gym and my credit card company that had the relationship. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a lot of personal interaction, but, uh, yeah, I was good um, at paying for gym memberships. I just wasn't very good at activating them. 
It's uh, one of my favorites, Macklemore's Let's Eat song. Do you know that song? Yeah. Mac- yeah. It's just so good. <laughs> that's what he, that's what he talks about the, the gym and then you go once and then you're never going again. I don't remember the line in the song, but it's so fun. Such a right. good song. Exactly. Um, so man, I feel like you and I could just keep talking for hours and yeah. hours and hours. Um, yeah. but I, I know we're getting a little, little towards the end of the time here. Maybe, um, one other topic that I think we should hit on just because we've talked we've teased around it a little bit is this book thing. So as you said, like you, you broke the four minute mile, you figured out it was possible to write a book and you know, what's, what's required. Mm-hmm. What about those listeners who are like, man, I, I think I've, I've got a book in me. I just don't know where to start. Like what's, yeah. what's the next step for, for that would be author. Um, it's a great question. Mine uh, I, I embrace the idea that everybody has a book in them. That, that's a quote from somewhere. I don't know who said it, but there's some quote, maybe it's a title of a book or something that, that inspires people to, to write their story. But I believe that. I believe everybody has a book in them. If you start to look at your life like a movie, your, your, your life is a story. And what, are, what is the story of that? you're the hero of your own journey. And this is counter to like story brand book where your client's supposed to be the hero. (laughs) The, the, the truth is, is that you are the hero of your own story and what is your story? And, um, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people in the world over the past year. It's been one of the greatest years of my life, this last 12, 12 to 13 months or so, as I've built this Instagram community that I have, and I have friends everywhere. And I think I talked last week about how much joy that brings me in my life. Um, there, these people have stories that I want to hear. I love when they post on their Instagram stories and they're walking down Warsaw, Poland, they're walking down the street. And I'm like, turn the camera, turn the camera. I just want to see where you are. Or they're in Ghana, Africa, and they're doing a video and I hear, you know, chickens squawking in the background. And I'm like, go outside. Don't stay where you are. Go walk outside. I want to see where you live. Uh, I'm so fascinated by that. And I think a lot of people hesitate to write something because to them, it's their life is not unique. It's just their life. It's their Mm, boring life. That's That's all they know. But to people all over in the world, it is completely fascinating because my life is different than your life. And I am interested in your life. And if anything, social media has proven this point over and over again over the last few years as you see people build massive influence in all countries all over the world through sharing, opening up and being authentically them and sharing their life they can build a massive, a massive audience because it's so fascinating to so many people. So don't dis, discount the fact that you have something unique to offer the world. And you need to start looking at your life as you're the hero of your journey. What is the story that you have to tell? And don't fool yourself into thinking that it isn't interesting because it will be interesting to some people in the world. Well, I think that is an excellent place to wrap up today. Um, You are more Janda on Instagram and one of your favorite places to connect anywhere else you want to rattle off for us. Uh, YouTube. I'm, I have a a YouTube channel that I plan to build. It's all more Janda there. Um, And you can go to my website, michaeljanda.com or morejanda.com and BizBuds podcast also with Tom, which is super fun too. So yeah, those are my connection places. Awesome. Well, if you guys haven't listened to the previous episode with Mike and uh, Tom together, be sure and go back and to listen to that one. And we'll be sure and to link to all of those in the show notes. Mike, thanks again so much for being here today. It was a oh, pleasure. Oh, that's so fun. Thank catching you. Catching up with you and learn a little more about you personally. Yeah, you too. I, I still have plenty of questions. I mean, ours, ours next one is probably over lunch sometime where we can get into the nitty gritty and not uh, breach all of the 
non-disclosures that we have with <laughs> whoever is in our past. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to get past coronavirus so I can get on a plane and come in. That's right. <laughs> Definitely. Come during ski season, man. We'll go ski. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I, I know enough to say yes to that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, yep. uh, thanks again. And thanks yeah. for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 146 in the books. This episode is brought to you by Yellow Images. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my different Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.